Hi, I'm Don Higgins with the Whitetail Master Academy, and I want to discuss a topic today that's been coming up a lot recently, and that is the subject of native versus non-native plants that the wildlife uh, habitat enthusiasts might use on their property. And I think the way we need to start is we need to start by defining some of these terms that we hear used a lot. Let's start with native and non-native. So, you know, obviously a native plant is one that has originated in this country. Um, one that's been here basically since the beginning of time. Um, God put it here, if you will. A non-native is a plant that originated in another country and that man has brought into this country. Um, there's all kinds of examples of that, uh, both in the, the wildlife sector and the landscaping industry, um, the agriculture industry. There's a lot of plants that have originated outside of this country that most people are not even aware of. So to start off, we want to really make sure that we understand native versus non-native. Native is from this country, non-native originated somewhere else and was brought to this country. You know, one of the reasons that a lot of people are up in arms about non-native species is that some of them have become invasive. Um, for example, the calorie pear tree. Um, in a lot of areas of the country, they're just, you know, popping up everywhere uh, at the detriment of native habitat. Um, another example would be, uh, you know, the Asian carp is a non-native species that are taking over some of our waterways or rivers and such. Um, again, a species that did not originate in this country. You know, I think a lot of these folks that are promoting natives only are well-intentioned, no doubt about it. They have the best of intentions, but they're misguided. They don't realize how many non-native species are in this country and are doing just fine. There have been some non-native species introduced to this country that have become invasive, and I named a couple of those. But you know, we've also got some native species that are very invasive as well. Take the red cedar, for example. Um, there's areas of this country where the red cedar has just taken over and dominated the ecosystem. So, you know, for a plant to be invasive, it does not have to be non-native. We've got plenty of native species that have become invasive as well. So let's look at another native species that's become very invasive, and that is water hemp. Talk to anyone who's tried growing soybeans, whether it be soybean food plots or a farmer growing large fields of soybeans, and they're gonna tell you how difficult it is to control water hemp. And yet water hemp originated right here in this country and has become very invasive. So the whole purpose of this video is to educate. That's the whole reason for the Whitetail Master Academy. We want to help you become a better land manager. And if you've bought into the idea that you can manage your whitetail property with only native species, I think you've been misled a little bit. And I'd like to show you how difficult that can be. And to start that process, I want to just start with some food plot species, some plants that we commonly put in our food plots, and let you see exactly where those plants originated from because I think you're gonna be surprised most of those are non-native. Let's look at soybeans. Did you know that soybeans come from China? How about corn? Did you know corn originated in Mexico? Oats? Oats are from Asia. Rye? Rye is also from Asia. Wheat? Wheat comes from the region of Iraq. Turnips? Again, turnips are from Asia. Radish? Radishes are from China. Sugar beets? Sugar beets come from Egypt. Clovers? You know, most clovers come from Europe. New Zealand is where a lot of those clovers originate. Austrian winter peas? They come from Turkey. Rape? Rape comes from Northern Europe. Sorghum? Sorghum is from Africa. Collards? Collards come from the Mediterranean region. Buckwheat? Again, from Asia. Chufa? Chufa is from Egypt. I've just listed 15 of the most common plant species that are planted in our food plots today, and every single one of those is non-native. And as I've done my research for this video, and I've plugged in one plant after another on my search engine to find out where those plants originated, I came up with one species that originated right here in North America, and that is the sunflower. The sunflower is the only commonly planted plant that we plant in our food plots that is native to this country. 
So now that we've talked about our food plot species, let's move on to some of the tree species that whitetail land managers commonly plant on their properties. Did you realize that apples are from Kazakhstan? They're not native to North America. How about pears? Did you know pears come from Asia? And chestnuts, the Dunstan chestnut that everybody rages about but yet nobody complains about, they are a cross, a hybrid cross between the American chestnut and a Chinese chestnut. Sawtooth oaks. Sawtooth oaks are commonly planted by whitetail land managers and yet they are from Asia. Again, if you're a whitetail land manager trying to stick with 100% all native species, you're going to have a very difficult time and your property is not even going to come close to the property that your neighbor next door is going to design. So we've covered several plant species that are non-native to this country. Let's look at a couple of animal species that you might not realize are not native to this country. The first is the ring-neck pheasant. It's a native of China and yet it's our most popular game bird by far probably. How about the brown trout? How many fishermen are there in this country that love catching brown trout? Brown trout are not native to North America. They come from Europe. There's just all kinds of examples in this country of species, both plant and animal, that are not native, but yet have become an everyday part of our lives. And it goes way beyond wildlife and wildlife habitat and even our ecosystems. Just look at the farming industry. You know, most livestock species did not come from this country. And especially when you start breaking that down, looking at various breeds, the Angus cattle, for example, uh, come from Scotland. So there's just all kinds of examples across our society of plant and animal species that are not native to this country, but have become an integral part of our society. And if you're going to try to manage habitat 100% with native species, you're going to be left in the dust. Now, I'm as passionate as anybody about being a good steward of our resources. There is no way I would encourage anyone to plant anything that I thought had a chance to be invasive. If you've followed me at all, you've probably heard me talk about my grandsons and how one day they are going to be the owners of, of my farm. The last thing I want to do is leave them a mess to clean up because I was passionate about killing big deer, so I planted something that's going to take over our entire farm. I think more of my responsibility as a steward than that. And saying this, non-native species have become a very important part of my wildlife habitat on my property. And I don't think I could have ever done what I've done without those non-native species. So one of the reasons that I feel my farm has been so good at producing mature bucks is the screening cover that I've grown on this farm. Um, it helps me get into my stands and out undetected. It uh, screens my property from the neighbors on the property line. It provides structure within my switchgrass fields, um, encourages deer to bed there. Um, and a lot of these native purists, if you will, will tout other species to use as screening. And did you realize that some of these annual screenings that are being promoted by these other folks are not native at all? Um, take, for example, Egyptian wheat. Egyptian wheat comes from the Middle East. Or sorghum Sudan grass. Sorghum Sudan grass comes from Eastern Africa. Um, I think when you go down that road of native versus non-native and you draw a hard line where you're going to stay on one side, I think you've really tied your hands as a land manager. There are good plant species and there are bad plant species on both sides of that line. And as a good land manager, you need to pick and choose the good ones from both sides, the good native plants and the good non-native plants. And if you'll do that and combine them, you'll have the best property you can possibly have. You know, I think these native purists who are promoting natives only as far as wildlife habitat, they're really kind of cherry picking the species that they're using for their argument. Sure, there's some non-native plants that have become invasive, and they'll be the first ones to throw them out as an example of why you don't use a non-native. But at the same time, they totally ignore those non-native species who have become so important uh, within our habitat and within our ecosystems. You know, we've named off a bunch of them. At the same time, when they look at the native species, 
they totally ignore those species like water hemp and like the red cedar, which can become invasive. So you really need to look at both sides of the native side and the, and the non-native side and realize that there are bad plants on both sides and there are some great plants on both sides. So I really want to dig into one of those non-native plants that's getting bashed really hard by those native purists, and that is giant miscanthus. Now I've had giant miscanthus growing on my own property for the last 10 years, and folks, I'm telling you, there is not a single giant miscanthus plant anywhere on my property except exactly where I planted it. When you plant these plants, you've got to plant a piece of root called a rhizome. Giant miscanthus is a sterile hybrid. It does not produce seed. The only way to propagate it is with a root rhizome. Miscanthus is a genus, and within the miscanthus genus, there's over 20 different varieties of these tall grasses. Some of those miscanthus varieties are absolutely invasive, and you absolutely do not want to plant them. Giant miscanthus is not one of those at all. It, again, it's a sterile hybrid. It does not even produce seed. You know, the crazy thing is, earlier in this video, I listed off 15 plant species that we find in our food plots that are non-native. Every one of them produces a seed, and yet the miscanthus does not even produce a seed, and yet these folks are all up in arms about giant miscanthus which has to be propagated by root rhizomes. You know, I think one really big reason that people get so up in arms about miscanthus also is that it looks very similar to a plant that is invasive called Phragmites. Both of them are very tall. Um, when you see them fully mature, both of them have that, that fluffy plume seed head on top. The difference is the giant miscanthus is sterile. There is nothing in that seed head, no seed whatsoever. The other thing I want to hit on is that giant miscanthus is very easy to kill with very common herbicides like glyphosate or Roundup. I actually had a strip on my farm just this past year that some of my plans, my habitat plan changed from my property and I wanted to spray that and kill it. I found it extremely easy to kill with just glyphosate. Glyphosate only just wiped it out and toasted it. Very easy to control should you change your mind on your habitat project. You know, one of the things that the critics throw out is that, of course, Don is gonna support Miscanthus because he sells Miscanthus. No, Don supports Miscanthus because he's seen what a benefit it was to his property. And after I saw that, then I started doing the research. And as part of that research, I flew along with Wes Delks and Terry Peer with Real World Wildlife Products we got on an airplane and we flew to two different universities and we looked at test plots at those universities as we was trying to decide the best variety that we would want to market under the real world brand. We did our research on the different varieties but also on whether that plant was invasive or not. And everything we could find told us that it was not invasive whatsoever. In fact, I found a website that clearly states that giant miscanthus is not listed as an invasive species on any state invasive species list or a national invasive species list. Folks, you've been misled. If anyone is telling you that giant miscanthus is invasive, they are wrong. You can take that to the bank. You know, stewardship is very important to me. If there was something better out there, I want to know about it because that's what I want to be planting on my farm. But at the same time, I'm going to be leaving this farm to my grandsons, as I mentioned earlier. I don't want to leave them a problem. I want to make the most of this property during my time as the steward as that I can, but I don't want to affect future generations. So as we end this video, I want to drive home some very important points. First of all, I understand exactly what an invasive species is, and I am absolutely against planting any invasive species. I've been on multiple properties around the country, both on my own property as well as those of my consulting clients. You know, I've seen things like bush honeysuckle, autumn olive, kudzu, where they've just taken over an ecosystem. So I totally understand the desire not to have invasive species on your property. 
But I also think that some of these naturalists are totally misguided. You cannot tell me that these folks don't have a single apple tree anywhere on their property, that they are against planting soybeans or corn in their food plots. I mean, there's got to be a balance, folks. There is good plant species that are native. There are good plant species that are non-native. There are bad plant species that are native, and there are bad plant species that are non-native. As a good land manager, we need to learn to pick some of the good ones from both sides, combine them to have the best property that we can. And doing so doesn't mean that either one is invasive. I think too many times the term non-native invasive or exotic invasive gets thrown out there wrongly and people start thinking that every non-native plant's invasive, we gotta avoid them. And that's not the case at all. The other thing that I really wanna stress is that giant miscanthus is a non-native plant, but it is not an invasive plant. It is very safe to plant. I've had it on my farm for a decade, have not seen it spread to one other plant besides what I've planted. It's easily controlled. And what really, uh, the point I really want to drive home here, folks, is if I thought for a second that giant miscanthus was going to be a problem for anyone down the road, I would not be promoting it in any way whatsoever. I did the homework. Real World Wildlife Products did the homework before this was ever brought to market. It is absolutely safe to plant. Now, I appreciate you watching this video. Uh, I'm sure you can tell that this is a subject that I'm very passionate about. Um, you know, creating good wildlife habitat on my own farm was my number one goal years ago. And I didn't set out to have a food plot seed company. Um, Real World Wildlife Products basically developed from uh, requests from friends uh, to plant the same things that I was planting. I, I was doing the research basically for my own property and uh, you know over time i seen the opportunity to share that with others and eventually turn it into a company and make a living doing that it's a passion i've got a passion for wildlife habitat i've got a passion for chasing giant whitetails and i kind of brought all that together in the whitetail master academy and these videos you know if we could put these all these videos on youtube and guess what we're at the mercy of someone else to to censor what we say or you know, to really tie our hands. And th this Master Academy has given me a platform to say exactly what I want to say and, and say it without any fear of censorship and to bring quality content to you. You know, I'm not just sharing things that I read about last week on the internet. Um, you can't believe how many hours of research I put into this one video alone. I wanted to prove my point. I wanted to prove that giant miscanthus is not invasive. I wanted to prove that you are being misled by these groups pushing all natives because there's so many plants and animals within our ecosystems today that are not native, and yet they are very valuable parts of our ecosystem. So we need to think about balance. Um, you can have all native if you want, but your property is not gonna be near as good as if you bring in some of these non-natives and uh, really enhance what the natives bring as well. Then you can have the ultimate whitetail property. And those are the kind of videos that we want to bring you here on the Whitetail Master Academy. Videos that help you take your property to the ultimate level.